strength to 
absence, all our fears are washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. Lord, in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Cloven tongues of fire, Father, to descend.
brought us to the mountain and planted us. Called us your own. kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Israel, eh, Hashabat, Layasore, Hashabat, Ledora Tambarino Lam, Visham Ru, Vene Israel, eh, Hashabat, Layasore, Hashabat, Ledora Tambarino Lam, Ubanevaim. Bane Israel, O T He Olam, O T He Olam, Visham Ru, Bane Israel, Et Hashabat, Leaso, Et Hashabat, Ledora Tambarin Olam, Kishe Shatayim, Asa Adonai, Asa Adonai Ed Hashemaim Ve'el Haaretz If Shamru V'nei Yisrael Ed Hashabat Le'asod Ed Hashabat Le'dor Atambarin Olam U'vayam Hashvayi Shabbat V'inafash Shabbat V'inafash Shavad Vainafash Vishamru Vene Israel Et Hashabat Leasur Et Hashabat Ledura Tambarin Olam Vishamru Vene Israel Et Hashabat Le'asoet ha'ashabat le'torah tambarin olam. I misplaced the key for the clicker. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, And he, Yeshua, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, on Shabbat, and stood up for to read. In Mark chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, it says, One of the Torah teachers came up to him and heard them engaged in this discussion. Seeing that Yeshua answered them well, he asked him, What is the most important mitzvah of them all? And Yeshua answered, The most important is Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one and you shall love the Lord with all your heart with all your soul 
with all your understanding and with all of your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other mitzvah greater than these. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Mahunto, Leolam Vayed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name and his glorious kingdom forever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your might. And have these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you arise. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Le'ahavta, le'araka, chamoka. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I need some gentlemen in the hoopah, please. And then we'll bring our little ones. I'm just going to put this here. Just watch the fan, gentlemen. <laughs> I need to get back here again. Now we can have our, our little ones join us under the hoopah. Uh, thank you, Abby. Did you put that in there already? Go ahead. Um, both. Let's do both. Grab, grab the mic back there for Abrina, because I want, I want everybody to hear. Yes, th this would be good. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, sharing blessings always good, huh? Yes. Um, I don't exactly qualify. Oh, well, I am some mother's child. <laughs> go, go turn her mic up a little. Something. It's on. Is it on? Yes. It's on. All right. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> we're getting ready for our new creations camp out. And Raina was kind enough to design a shirt for us. Um, our shepherd, Bruce, asked that the kiddos have a shirt that represents their group. So it looks exactly like she designed it. And uh, on the back is change for change and all their names. So... If anybody's live streaming who's planning to attend, should you be Chuck or Cadence or Rachel or Valen or Varick or Zamara, listen up. I got the others captive here. I went in yesterday to pick up the shirts. We were on our way coming back from the beach, and the lady called and said, I'll have them ready in an hour. We were about 15 minutes away. We managed to find something to do at Chick-fil-A in one store <laughs> until... They were ready. When we got to the um, fact, the place of business, I got out, and a gentleman on to my right got out of a vehicle, and I just noticed he was there, and so he kind of beat me to the door and opened the door for me. And when I walked in, I saw the shirt lady, and she in her office, and she says, "I'm just fixing your invoice," and he up against the doorpost, and. Um, he says, so, so what are you getting shirts for? And uh, I told him, 
And he said, so where do you go to church? And I said, we go to a fellowship in Brattle Creek, Virginia. And he says, you got to go all the way to Brattle Creek for church? And I said, well, no, we don't have to go, but we feel that the Holy Spirit has called us to be there. He said, I get that. I get that. And I said, and we're in Allegheny County, so it's not like we're driving as far as you might think. And so we chit-chat back and forth, and the lady says, uh, um, how would you like this invoice made out to you or, or to your church? And I said, you just make it out to the ark. And he goes, is that the ark here? And I, I said, no, it's, it's where we worship. And uh, so I said, could I pay by card? She says, we take check or cash. I said, not a problem. I get out my checkbook, and I am writing out the check. And I say, how much do I write it for? And she said, $182.97. And immediately he said, would you allow me to pay for this for you, for your group? And I said, oh, yeah, I understand what's going on. I get it. We'll be happy to receive this blessing. And um, so he he gets out two hundred dollar bills and he takes it over and hands up to her and she stands up and she says i can see right now the direction this tra this transaction is going in i want to contribute and so knock off everything but a hundred dollars so she pretty much gave up her profit so on this receipt it said paid in full and i added by our abba father and because we want to appreciate and show gratitude for these people's heart, we need to pray for them. Putting that receipt right in there, prayed for, then we, we want to remember them. So um, a little bit later, got our schedule now for the camp out, everything we're going to be doing, all of our activities, our menu, everything to make you wish you other people were coming, but oh well. So um, just wanted to share that blessing with you guys. I was crying. They were crying. We were hugging. It was, it was all. And I got out to the car. And I go, I can't wait to tell you what happened. But first, I just need to tell it once. Get Bruce and Lynn on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> we're on speakerphone and got to share that. And it's just as exciting to share it with you guys today. So thank you. Father, for the blessing of our children, they, 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 our inheritance. This is our inheritance. And to see that total strangers are being getting involved. Seems like the Father says that, you know, I have laid up treasures. I've laid up the wealth, the wealth of the world for my people. There are many places where it talks about that, that when, when uh, the people are returning, that they will bring with them gifts. And then uh, we get to experience and get to see that. So as we sing this blessing over our children, hearts of gratitude for who they are, for the treasures that they truly are. And we see that the Father sees them as treasures as well, that He cares. His eye is on those little sparrows. And he watches over them, each and every one of them. So I ask that as we sing this blessing over the children, that you extend your hand toward them and we just witness an example where the father does care and does cover them and blesses them we ask that where our hand ends that the father's hand continue may the Lord protect 
and defend you. May he always shield you from shame. May you come to be in Israel a shining name. And like David, may you be deserving of praise. Strengthen them, O Lord, and keep them from the stranger's ways. May God bless you and grant you long life. make you good husbands and wives. May the Lord protect and defend you. May the Lord preserve you from pain. Favor them, O Lord, with happiness and peace, oh, hear our Sabbath prayer. Amen. Abba, Father, our hearts are so filled with gratitude. And you know, Father, as I shared this blessing story, another person this was the reply I got all children are special yesterday I enjoyed children on a school bus today I enjoyed bird children and their parents in the flower beds for surely God created all father go with them protect them and give them a heart to seek you out in all they do. It is in Messiah's name we pray. Amen.
Shabbat Shalom. This week's Torah portion, Behar, in the mountain or on the mountain, the, the bet in front of Har, Har is the word for mountain, <coughs> Bet can mean in or on. Last week, I had spoken a little bit about if you take the last three Torah portions of Vaikra, Leviticus, and you put them together, it creates a little sentence. Last week was Imor, which is to say or to speak. This week, Behar in or on the mountain, and next week will be Behukotai, my statutes, my rulings. So speak on the mountain, my statutes. We have a similar, we have a parallel, a similar passage in Matthew chapter 5 that says, the Sermon on the Mount, <laughs> it's entitled, Okay, and I, I, I think this, I'll share just a little bit of, of the parallels between the two, between Leviticus 21 through 27 and Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, share some of those today. It's really, really interesting. When Yeshua was speaking the Sermon on the Mount, we can find a lot of parallels that come right out of these, these three Torah portions and appropriately named as such. So this Torah portion starts in Leviticus 25 in verse 1. Starting in verse 1, it says, Adonai spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai. No. Yes. Bahar on the mountain <laughs> spoke yeah Adonai spoke to Moshe on the mount on Mount Sinai and he said tell the people of Israel when you enter the land I'm giving you the land itself is to observe a Shabbat rest for Adonai Alvino Makano our father our king we thank you father for your Shabbat for your Sabbath Father, we thank you for the instruction that your word gives us. That as covenant people, you give us covenant rules. How to live as a covenantial people. People that are in covenant with you. You hide nothing from us. As the scripture says, we don't have to ascend the mountain to bring it down. We don't have to go to Sheol to bring it up. But you have given it to us, even written it, put it in, it, put it in our hearts, put it on us and in us. We thank you, Father. Ask, Father, that the worship, that our song, that our praise, that you hear our cry. Father, anoint us cover us. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that, that fire, Father, that gives us that power that we need to continue as the world as dark gets darker. May that light shine brighter. May we reflect Yeshua, our Messiah, even more. We ask, Father, that you give us the strength and the courage and the wisdom the words to say as these challenges ahead of us come that we can be a witness, a testimony to who God is, who Israel is, who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is, who Messiah Yeshua is, that we have that testimony and that people can just see it all over us. 
We thank you, Father, for the encouragement, for the blessings. We ask, Father, that you be with those that aren't with us today that are sick or for, for whatever reason, Father, that you touch them, bless them, anoint them, Father. Cover them with your ruach, with your cloud, Father, with your Shekinah. We ask, Father, for your guidance as we look at your word this morning. Father, may the, the words that are spoken be your words. And may they fall, Father, on fertile soil. May we leave here changed. Either through music, through the worship, through your word. May we draw one step closer as we go up the mountain. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen and amen. The book of Leviticus by Ikra only covers about one month of time. So all of this instruction we, we've been covering for weeks uh, actually is, is, is really only covers about a month, month and a half of, of time. Um, right at the end of Exodus, the tabernacle was completed and everything was set up. We had the, the, the glory fell. And then for, for this that time that we've been, the Vaikra, we've been going through instruction We've been uh, getting instruction on offerings, one through six of, of Vaikra spoke to, to offerings. We've gotten in, in, received instruction for holy and the profane, for clean and unclean, how to live in the land, purification, the feast, the Sabbaths. In last week's Torah portion, it, it spoke to uh, the, the Shabbat included in with the feasts and that we were to have a holy convocation, a, a gathering for the community, that God looks at us as individuals, but, he, but his desire is for us to be family and community to come together. We've, we've had instruction on food, relationships, uh, things that, cause us, that, would, that would cause us to be unclean or unholy. Uh, instructions for the priest. So uh, we went through and how, how the, their instruction would be a little different than the instruction for the, the average or for the, the Israelite. They were held to a, a higher uh, standard, a, 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 I guess standard really isn't a, a good word, but to, that because of their holiness, there were different requirements that they, they had to meet when it came to relationships and things that they could touch and not touch, you know. Uh, justice also, instruction on justice, uh, instruction on blessings, and next, um, next week we'll get into uh, Leviticus 26, we'll, we'll talk about punishment for disobedience. So uh, one of the things that we've we're been talking about, we've been learning about covenants and covenantal rules uh, how to be in covenant with the Father, how to, how to live in that covenant. Uh, the question becomes, do we want to live by his rules? I want to start off <laughs> this, this morning as, as I was going through this. Um, usually the way lessons are taught, you kind of start off with you know, the, the instruction and then as you get to the end, we kind of, Sometimes we get our toes stepped on, and uh, I want to tell a story, and maybe this, uh, <laughs> here's the story. My past job, I was a videographer for depositions, testimony. Most of the time when you went into uh, a deposition, uh, this particular case was a med mal case, there was a sponge that was left in an individual and um, they were able to retrieve it but it caused some damage. Normally the way a deposition goes the 
attorneys get together and the attorney that represents the plaintiff, the lady that was injured, they began to ask a series of questions. And they generally start off with your background, your education, you know, and those things. This particular deposition caught everybody off guard. Once the witness was sworn in, the attorney for the plaintiff, instead of asking, so doctor, tell me where you went to school, your credits and so on and so forth, he says, so tell me, why did you leave the sponge in the lady? <laughs> I mean, it just totally caught everybody off guard. It was like he just brought out the hammer and and I mean, it, and it set the, it set the uh, tone for the rest of the deposition, of course, because this it immediately put this guy on the defensive. Sometimes with the father's instructions, it comes out that way. It comes out as, as a hammer. And sometimes we have the natural reaction to step back on our heels and, you know, uh, come off defensive. So there are times where we have instruction uh, that, that comes across that way that um, be careful <laughs> there are there are times you know uh, so, uh, yes so I, I just wanted to share that story because again there are times where the father will you know he doesn't it's especially people that are that are pursuing him he, you know he disciplines those that he loves and so if sometimes you know something challenges you and kind of rocks you back, think of that story for for a moment and say, "Okay, how am I reacting? Am I am I getting defensive, or or you know, am I willing to receive the instruction that, that's coming, that's forthcoming?" In our in our so what we've been talking about is living. Um, how to live in covenant with the Father, the rules, the covenantal rules. I think I'm saying that right. Covenantual rules <laughs> of being in covenant. So do we live by his rules? Do we make choices every day on matters? We make, we make choices. Will we obey? Or do we catch ourselves negotiating with the Father? Well, do I have to, or how much of that do I have to, or, you know, and we begin, we begin negotiating. Um, do I really have to, you know, something related to food, something related to my speech? Do I really have to? Do I, is it okay being kind, giving and tithing, the feast and the Shabbat, all, all of these things? Where, what, do I, what do I have to do? When, when it, being in covenant is about being willing to and what I get to do, those things that I, that I get to do. So how does this tie into our Torah portion today? The last uh, five Torah portions, Akka remote, after the death, Kiddushim, holiness, Imor, spoke or speak, uh, Bahar Bahukotai. After the death becomes holiness. Speak from the mountain. My statutes are my instructions. So after the death of Nadab and Abahu, but after our death, after our physical death, our, our, our flesh, crucifying the flesh, becomes this walk of holiness, which now we're walking as priests. When an Israelite slave was purchased by a priest, he is now a part of the priest family. We've been purchased by a priest, a great high priest, and we become a part of that family. We have been elevated to a higher standard. So this is this is where this is going to tie into Matthew chapter five uh, in just a moment. A priest is to give his best. So let's jump back just two chapter, three chapters here to Leviticus twenty-two. 
in verses 20 through 21. This is about uh, 21 and 22 are about the, the holiness of a priest, these two chapters. In verse 20, it says, you're not, is that big enough? <laughs> I can, I can do this. You're not to bring anything with a defect because it will not be accepted from you. Whoever brings a sacrifice of peace offering to Adonai in fulfillment of a vow or a voluntary, voluntary offering, whether it comes from the herd or from the flock, it must be unblemished without defect in order to be accepted. We're not to bring something defective or unclean to the Father. If we become unclean, if we were to offer an offering like this, it would cause us to be defiled. It wouldn't, the offering wouldn't be accepted. And we're going to tie this into Matthew uh, chapter 5 where Yeshua speaks of the acceptable offering. If you bring an offering and there you remember that a brother has ought against you, leave the offering, go fix that relationship and then come back and offer the offering. If you're to offer the offering without doing that, it becomes unacceptable, unholy, unclean. So when an individual is unclean or unholy, they're removed from service. Do you follow that? You, a priest, if he were to do something like that, he would be removed from service. Who determines whether the gift is acceptable or not acceptable? We tend to think that it's our, in our hands. Well, I determine whether this is an acceptable gift or not. But it's the Father that makes that decision, whether the gift, we're, we're to inspect it, but he, he, he ultimately makes the determination whether it has been an acceptable gift. This is why even at the end of our worship, our prayer, I ask, Father, I pray that what we have offered to you today was an acceptable gift. Because without that acceptance, there's no presence. The power of God is not found in the courts where the animals are sacrificed and offered as we read this morning in Psalms about his face shining, where does that happen? It happens in the holy place or the holy of holies, right? That's where, that's where the Father is. That's where he is. So, the power of God is found in the holy of holies. This is where God's face shines on us as we read this morning in, in Psalms chapter 80 that we, we ask him to return to Teshuv as we approach. And we have, we, have, we have come to an understanding by reading the book of Vaikra of what is holiness is, what, what um, defiles us, those things that will defile us, that we can abstain or we can have those things removed from our lives and be holy because he is holy thus allowing us to enter into that place where his face can shine on us. So it's our sin it, it, that separates us from, from the Father. It's so, so there's some, something that we have to do on our part. So as we're going through these, through these instructions, how to live in, in, by covenant rules, being in covenant with the Father, this is how the Father relates to people is through, through covenants. We've been talking about this on Thursday nights, talk, using the, the phrase, uh, and we lost you, sorry. <laughs> uh, talking about covenants and how that the Father deals with, with people through covenants. And then there are promises inside of those covenants. So when he, when he makes a covenant with somebody, we were, talking, we we're talking about the final redemption. We actually kind of started a, a, a little bit of a teaching on the book of Revelation. And I mentioned the word uh, that final redemption. And 
I really felt like we needed to go back and kind of get an understanding of that term or that phrase. And, and so it, it deals with covenant, starting with Ab, Adam and coming all the way up through the covenant that God made with the children of Israel was a redemption out of Egypt, but there is going to be a final redemption that is going to pale that redemption, the redemption of Egypt. But the patterns are, are set out and laid out there for us. So we've been talking about covenants and how that covenants don't come to an end, like contracts. But if we walk in the covenant, you walk in the blessing, in obedience, if you do not abide by the covenant, God doesn't end the covenant, there's punishment. And we're going to see next week in chapter 26 that the more you go down that trail, the more intense the punishment or the longer the punishment in <coughs> increases. So it's not that the, the covenant came to an end, but it's that the people walked away from it. So w as we are beginning to wake up and, uh, and come back uh, to our roots, to our foundations, and beginning to realize that we are a covenant people with the Father, that we are in covenant with him, we want to know the rules. We want to know how to live. What are the rules for living as a covenant individual? And so these are, these are what, what we are going over. Last week's Torah portion included the Feast of the Lord. It was uh, in chapter 23, I believe it was. Dealt with all of the Feast of the Lord. And these were kind of a, an annual. Here's, here's the annual feast. Um, as we return to our roots, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, uh, we see things happening and p we see people interested in the feast and keeping the feast. So last week spoke to, of the feast on a, a yearly basis. This week we're going to address what happens when there are multiple years. When we, when we s celebrate feast year after year after year, the Father is going to give us some instruction on, okay, now here's what you do with multiple years. So let's go to our Torah portion. Leviticus 25.1. And we're going to read a little bit here. Adonai spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai, Bahar, and said, Tell the people of Israel, when you enter the land I'm giving you, the land itself is to observe a Shabbat rest, a Shabbat rest for Adonai. Six years you will sow your field. Six years you will prune your grapevines and gather their produce. So we see a pattern here already, the the six day work week and then the seventh day or the seventh year that is to be a rest in the seventh year it is to be a Shabbat of complete rest for the land a Shabbat for Adonai you will neither sow your field nor prune your grapevines you are not to harvest what grows you are not to harvest what grows by itself from the seeds left by the previous harvest and you are not to gather the grapes of your untended vine. It is to be a year of complete rest for the land. But what the land produces during the year of the Sabbath will be food for you all. All right, this gets a little confusing. Wait a minute. <laughs> I thought we weren't to harvest. It, it said in verse 5, you are not to gather the grapes of the untended, uh, you are not to harvest or gather the grapes, but the land produce, uh, verse 6, but what the land produces on the Sabbath year will be food for you, you, your servant, your maid, your employee, everyone living near you, your livestock, the wild animals on your land, everything the land produces may be used for food. Okay, harvest. The word harvest is kind of the key here. So in the seventh year, they didn't plant. But you were allowed to partake of, the fields were open, every field. The rich man, every, every field was open on the seventh year. And what grew naturally could be food for you. 
for everybody. So you could, if you needed food, you could go to the richest man in town, to his field, and for a year, you got to be rich. <laughs> you were only to take what you needed. Kind of like, remember gathering the manna? You were only to gather what you needed. If you took more than you needed, then you were harvesting. You were, you were going beyond what you needed, but you were to take and gather what you needed. And for a year, an individual got to live you know, as, as a rich person. The fields were, were open. All, of the, all the produce was opened up. And so you were just to go, as they did with the manna, gather what you needed, and that, w that would be your food. So f this was for uh, everyone, for you, for your servant, for your maid, your employee, everyone living near you, your livestock, the wild animals on your land, everything that the land produces may be used for food. So, does, so, does, so harvesting would be more of gathering to sell it or you know, to store it. And you, were, you were not to, to do that, but you were only to take what you needed. Does that make sense? Is it so, so that hopefully unconfuses that just 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 a little bit. Uh, again, think of the the manna story. It kind of kind of connects that together. So, back up at on the mountain here, Adam and I spoke to Moshe on. Uh, Mount Sinai. So remember, we're, we're still we're still here still here at the mount. They haven't left the mount yet. So why? One of the questions becomes why did why did God take the children of Israel out into the wilderness to give them the Torah? Why was why was the instruction given out there? I mean, he could have done it in a town, a city, a country, but he took it took them to a place where there's there's no ownership. It's his, his wilderness, so it could never. So the Torah could never be said. Well, it was given to these specific individuals because this was their country or their land, but it was it was given to everyone. This was just a demonstration that it was for all people in the wilderness. The wilderness belongs to no one. There are no highways in the wilderness. There's maybe animal paths, but there's no roads. No, no natural, or I mean, uh, uh, normally road systems. They were taken out into the wilderness, a place of freedom, a place of, of no ownership, and the instruction was given. Again, to kind of uh, speak toward that the instruction was for all people. So Adam and I spoke to Moshe on the mountain. The mountain represents where God dwells, where, where Adam and I, where his, his dwelling place. In Exodus chapter 15, so we're going to look at this just a little bit. Um, this morning we talked of, of in Psalms 80 about the vine that was that the father planted, that he took it, to, took the vine to the mountain, and he planted it. In Exodus 15, and we go down to verse 17. It says, you will bring them in and plant them on the mountain, which is your heritage, the place, Adonai, that you made your abode, the sanctuary, Adonai, which your hands established. Adonai will reign forever and ever. So uh, being planted, so he brought the children of Israel out. He brought them to the mountain and planted them. So we're we're. We're talking about this week's Torah portion on the mountain. This is a place of planting, a place of receiving instruction, a place of, of receiving life, instruction for life. So what does it mean to be planted in or on his mountain? That planting connects us to him, to his covenants and to his promises. When Moshe was told at the burning bush, the son, I want you to bring the children out of Israel out 
and you'll bring them to this place. This will be a sign that they come here and they, they worship me. They come to the mountain. The place. Interesting. Uh, the first place that the first place that you see the place is uh, actually, or these words, is actually when God removed Eve from the side and it says that he closed the place. So it was a place where, where, where life, life came from, Eve coming from the side or the place where the father removed, pulled Eve out, took Eve out of Adam and closed up the place. The next time that we see this, of course, is with uh, Abraham when he raises his eyes and he sees the place where he's taking Isaac, him and Isaac are going. Jacob uh, refers to the place and he calls it Bethel at one time and he calls it, uh, which is the house of God, Bethel. The next time he is there, he calls it Paniel or the face of God. So we mentioned this earlier that, that the father shines his face on us where on the mount this is a, this was the the place uh, Moses, the place where you are standing, Moses, is holy when he's at the burning bush he says the the place, the place where you are standing so going going into the land and being planted, so this is what the children of Israel are getting ready to do in Leviticus. Uh, 25 they're getting ready to go in and he says when you enter the land you are to keep and observe my sabbath my shabbat i'm going in and i'm taking you in there and i'm going to plant you this morning we read psalms 80 verses 8 through 9 we will reread real quickly It says, I brought a vine out of Egypt. You expelled the nations ahead of you. I brought you out and brought you into this land and planted that vine. He planted that vine. He cleared a space for it, and it took root firmly and filled the land. So this is uh, on the Yovel. The land goes back to its original owners. So we're... we're we're seeing we're going to be, see kind of a parallel here that the father took the children of Israel into the land. He planted them there. His intention is for them to remain there, which eventually we will do. There will be a time where we return and we get planted in the land, okay? And he will clear the, he will clear the space for us. People have often asked, is there going to be enough room? Well, it says right here, he'll, he'll clear the space for us. There'll be enough room. So... Uh, uh, so who owns who, who owns the land? The land that God gave to Abraham, that promised to Abraham. He he owns the land. So we're going to talk get, uh, as we move toward the Yovel. We're going to speak to that just a little bit more here in a moment. Isaiah. I want to look quickly here at Isaiah chapter five. And it speaks of this vineyard. But what happens when there's disobedience? In Isaiah, really this whole chapter, but I just want to read a couple verses from here. In verse uh, 1, I want to sing a song for someone I love, a song about my loved one and his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hill or a mountain. He dug up its stones and cleared them away, planted it with choicest vines, built a watchtower in the middle of it, and carved out in its rocks a wine press. He expected it to produce good grapes, but the people <laughs> wouldn't listen, and so it produced sour and wild grapes. And it goes on to say here that that the father dealt with them, he dealt with them, and finally the punishment becomes the land will expel you. So as I was uh, reading this and, and you know, kind of going over this, 
the thought went into come into my head <laughs> the picture of the garden of eden god took adam and created adam outside of the garden the children of israel created outside of the land he took adam and he placed him in the garden he took the children of israel and placed them in Israel, in the land of Israel. Adam did something that defiled himself, him and Eve. They brought sin into the world and were cast out. The children of Israel rebelled, just wouldn't listen, wouldn't listen to the covenantal instructions and follow the instructions, and the land expelled them. So as I was Going through this Torah portion, the, you know, speaking to the Yovel, the, sh- the Shemitahs, and, and so on, f- coming at it from that perspective, think of the Garden of Eden. God, who owned the Garden of Eden? The Father did, the Creator. He placed man in it to, to take care of it. Who owned Israel? The Father did. He placed men in it to take care of it. He set up a system so that no individual would ever own or could buy or purchase all of the land by by creating the Yovel. It was always at the end, it was to go back to the original owners. When you purchased the land, you didn't purchase the land, but you leased it. Basically what we do nowadays with farmland, the farmer leases property um, and farms it and pays a, a lease in uh, uh, in hopes that it will produce a crop and he will he will benefit from that crop same principle with the with the yovel that so i don't know if we'll get time and to get a little deep into this but so if you were uh if you owned a piece of land and you were you needed money you could sell the you could lease your land to a farmer and he would pay you for the crops, for the estimated crops that it would produce. We're going to talk a little bit here what the store portion speaks to that you're not to be unjust to a, to a fellow individual, that you're to be fair with the amount, the price that is sold, the, the price that is, is traded. So, but somebody could come along and a, a a wealthy kinsman, a kinsman redeemer in our Haftor portion kind of deals with this a little bit with Jeremiah that he's told to purchase a piece of land for a, a relative and to buy them out of that lease and that the land would go back and, and that release would happen. The land would go back to, to the family. Of course, there are all kind of spiritual impacts to this. <laughs> from uh, dealing with us or dealing with the kinsman redeemer. But I just want to kind of touch real quickly on how, how that Yovel worked, how that worked out. Okay. In Leviticus chapter 19, we're going to continue on the planting uh, theme for just a moment. This was last, last week's tour portion. Uh, Leviticus 19... 23 and 25. So the father planted Israel and the father gives instruction to the children of Israel. Leviticus 19, 23 and through 25. When you enter the land and plant various kinds of fruit trees, you are to regard its fruit as forbidden for three years. It will be forbidden to you and not eaten. In the fourth year, all its fruit will be holy for praising Adonai. In the fifth year, you may eat its fruit so that it will produce even more for you. I am Adonai, your God. Now, uh, where where are we doing on time? Okay, we aren't going. Okay. Let me just paraphrase this real quickly. Three years. And during the Yovel, you had a Shemitah year, you had the Yovel, and then you had the plant, and there wasn't a harvest for three years. So you had the Shemitah, no harvest, the Yovel, the 49th year, the 50th year, and then the 
second year of the next cycle. I know it sounds a little confusing. The 50th year is the first year of the next 49 year cycle. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's seven year cycles. 49, seven, 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 just like our, just like we're counting the Omer, counting up, counting up to the, the Omer. 49, the 50th year is the first year of the next cycle, but you didn't plant during that year. Into the second year, you would have planted and you wouldn't get a harvest then. At the end, end of the Shemitah, you would have planted, but you wouldn't get a harvest until the next year. So three years. So it's just interesting. There's a little parallel here that for three years, um, you're to regard the fruit as forbidden. It almost fits right into this, this Shemitah uh, I'm sorry, sorry, Yovel time frame. The word Yovel, real quickly, means ram's horn. <laughs> uh, Jubilee doesn't, well, it's our English, trans English translation, well, what's the word that I'm looking for? That it's a, Transliteration, that's the word. It's a transliteration of, of the word yovel. It actually means to, to sound a shofar, to a, a ram's horn, to blow a ram's horn. Yom, Yom Kippur, for, uh, lands on Yom Kippur, yeah. Okay, uh, so trees, so he says to go in and plant these trees. Trees r often represent people in scripture. Psalms 1, 1 uh, through 3 talks about trees that are planted by streams of, of water. Uh, so here we are seeing that the, the Father's provision, his promise to provide when the children of Israel, when they enter into the land. The land, uh, like the Garden of Eden, belongs to the Father. Um, Psalms 24. Psalms 24, 1. The earth is Adonai's with all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. So the Father owns the earth. All of, the, all of it is his anyway. We just are the caretakers of what he has created and what he has, he has given to us. Leviticus 25, back to our Torah portion. We're going to jump down a verse, just to jump down to 23, 25-23. Just speaking of who the land belongs to. The land is not to be sold in perpetuity because the land belongs to me, Adonai says. You are only foreigners and temporary residents with it. So all that the land produces, all that the, this was why um, when the farmers on the Shemitah, on the seventh year, opened up the gates, opened up their fields, it wasn't necessarily their property. <laughs> it, was, it was the father's property. The owner had just been given the care or the caretaking of the property. And we see that kind of, I mean, if I saw in, uh, every seven years the neighborhood come wandering onto my property, we <laughs> I have gates and fences and signs that say, no trespassing. <laughs> what are they doing on my property? Uh, <laughs> can't they read? <laughs> so we, we, we have to change our mindset just a little bit, begin to, to change that. That all that the Father has blessed us with belongs to him he has promised provision i will provide for you blessing is something over and above provision what are we what are we supposed to do with blessing that becomes the question that you have to answer what do you do with blessing i will provide for you but as americans what we tend to do with blessing is oh i can afford that What is the purpose, the intention of what the Father has blessed you with? What is his intention? 
So we are, we are to dwell in the land, but we're in the land with him. This is, this is his land. This is his. So, so we have to look at it as, as we're dwelling with him, a place that, that is his, and I get to dwell with him because it is his. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul speaks to this in a spiritual level, from a spiritual aspect. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And Paul says, Or don't you know that your body is the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh who lives inside of you? whom you received from God. The fact is, you don't belong to yourself, for you have been bought at a price. So your bodies, so use your bodies to glorify God. Speaking to this, this Yovel, you've been purchased with a price. You have been bought back. And we'll get, uh, next week, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this and the, uh, the healing that takes place with the lady that's bent over where she was the adversary had her in captivity and Yeshua freed her so you've been bought with a price all of us have been bought with a price but we don't tend to act that way and I'll speak for me there are times where I don't act that way where I I feel that you know, I do, you you want you want to do things that are that are self-ish, <laughs> and you don't realize, hey, you know what, this this body is not mine; it's his. It's he has he has bought and paid for this this temple, and I I, sh- I need to remember that and and act that way, live that way. So Adonai owns, owns the land, he owns us, and as, because of that, again, he has these rules, he has these uh, instructions that there is a, to be a Sabbath, there's to be a Sabbath, a Shemitah, there's to be a Yovel. By keeping the Sabbath, by keeping the seventh year, the this, this Shemitah, it showed, it demonstrated the children of Israel putting their trust in God. I mean, can you imagine not working for a year? I mean, that if, if somebody were to ask, well, how do I keep the, the Shemitah? Take a year off. I mean, uh, was, the question comes up about gardens and planting and, and this and that. And, um, you know, those... Those are our ways, but if you this was an agricultural system, these people didn't work for a year. If you wanted, you know, wanted to <laughs> try and, and remember, these are are instruction for the land. We uh, in the diaspora do the best that we can to to try to honor these instructions. This is one of those instructions, though, that that was that was for the land. Why? 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 Because it was holy. That land was holy. It was set apart. Just like the priest was holy and set apart. Just like the instruments used in the temple, the tabernacle, were holy and set apart. They were not to be used for some other purpose. The the holy land was to be a light, a beacon, a demonstration of the Father and the way that covenant people lived in his dwelling place, in his area that was his ownership. And so these were put in place for that land because that land is holy. As people of God, we are holy. And if we are the temple of God, then some of these instructions, such as the Shabbat and those things, our diets and so on, will also apply if if we want to be those priests that we're called to be. 
by demonstrating also by taking this year off, it showed that he was their source. Not only did they trust him, but that they truly, that he was their source. It was also a sign, a seal, a mark of the covenant. It was a sign that they were in, in covenant. This will be a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Shabbat whether it's the Shemitah, whether it's the Yovel, whether it's the weekly, this, the weekly uh, Shabbat. This will be a sign. This will be, this will be a sign of the covenant that, that we are in covenant with, with one another. Uh, taking a day off once a week, taking a year off once every seven years, and taking two years every 50, every 49 years. It was set up so that... Um, a person should get to enjoy a Yovel once in their lifetime. Uh, Everybody was expected to live past 50, and so it was was anticipated that everyone would get to celebrate one Yovel. So by not keeping the covenant would cause the exile out of the land, out of the Holy Land, out of the Garden of Eden. By not keeping the covenant, you're expelled, you're kicked out. Being removed from the Father's presence and from his promises. So this portion uh, opens, this this is really, really interesting. This Torah portion opens up with speaking to a Shabbat that you are to, when you enter the land, the land is to observe a Shabbat. And we end in 26.2. And it says, keep my Shabbats. Revere my sanctuary, for Ad- I am Adonai. So this, this Torah portion is bookend by the Sabbath. Do you think the Father considers the Sabbath important, the Shemitah is important? So much so that he kicked the children of Israel out, and they went into exile for 70 years. So kind of, kind of a big deal for the Father. Um, so the father's trying to teach the children of Israel to trust and to rely on him this was the same instruction that he had given Adam look Adam I'm putting you in the garden of all the trees that are here you can partake of just leave this one tree alone this tree is set apart it's sanctified (laughs) you aren't to touch it it's set apart. Of everything else, you can you can have, but le- leave this this one alone. Uh, and we talked about the shemitah, uh, the exile in the Babylon for seventy years. And Jeremiah and Ezekiel speak to those. The father was was serious about about his Sabbath. So these were the shemitahs. Is there a punishment for not keeping the yovel? I haven't seen it yet, um, but uh, there has to be. <laughs> there has to be, a, you know, what, what the punishment for the Shemitahs, where they, they were expelled, kicked out of the land, what, it, what would be the punishment then for, um, for the um, not keeping the, the Yovel? Maybe like, the, yeah, like an end. Say, say, so if we use the thought, that it came once a generation, that uh, every generation would enjoy it, maybe by not keeping it, speaks to the end of the, the generation or, or something. But anyway, um, so it's, so it, yeah. I haven't run across, if somebody does, would they share that with me? <laughs> what the punishment is for not keeping the Yovel. Uh, like the, uh, the Shemitah, and the Omer, we see the, the comparisons there, the counting of days and one's counting of, of years. So the Shemitah, uh, a time for the land to rest. Also, a, uh, there was a release of property. There was t- a time when uh, at the Yovel that prisoners were set free that or, or I won't say prisoners slaves when indentured servants 
not only were they set free on the Shemitah, but also on the Yovel. Interesting thing, the timing, when, when the Yovel starts. It starts on Yom Kippur, which is a, a, the Day of Atonement, which is, speaks to a freedom, a time that we are atoned, or we are atoned for, and that the scapegoat and, uh, that took place, and there was a, a release. We were covered or released from our, our sins. So the high priest on Yom Kippur was going into the holy place, the Holy of Holies. On, on Yom Kippur, this, uh, this was the start of the Yovel. In Leviticus, so Leviticus chapter 4, I want to read a couple things here about the high priest. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 3. It says, If it is the anointed priest who has sinned, and thus brought guilt on the people. He is to offer Adonai a young bull without defect as a sin offering for his sins that he committed. The high priest could bring a, a curse or guilt on the children of Israel, on, on, the, on the nation. Just like Adam, the first priest, high priest, in the, uh, this is kind of the way I look at it, he, in the Holy of Holies, he's in the midst of the garden at the Tree of Life, commits and brings guilt on himself and everything that he has authority over, which God said that he was to have authority over the earth and over the animals. He had authority over, over everything. By, by, by bringing guilt upon himself, he brought guilt upon the world. We see that represented here with, with the, the high priest. By, by him, he, he had to go in and atone for his sins so that he didn't bring guilt upon the nation of Israel. So if the high priest had sinned, he brought guilt upon the people, then everything under his authority would, be, uh, would come under that guilt. Uh, this is why Yeshua had to be sinless because we or under his authority. The atonement makes uh, service makes it possible for the Father to continue dwelling among his people, even though we are still in a sinful nature. So it was through that process, through that, that atonement, that being set free, the time of the Yovel, that uh, the Father, it, it set, um, uh, how do I word this? Uh, it continued to let him uh, dwell among us. Also, Remember something else about the high priest. You remember the, um, the cities of refuge? That when an individual went to a city of refuge after you know, if he'd committed a uh, death, caused a death, but not an intentional death, and he runs to a city of refuge, and he is to remain there, but there comes a point in time where he can go home. Do you all remember when that is? Uh, yeah, the death of, death of the high priest. So at the death of the high priest, he was released. He could go back home. It's a picture of the, the Yovel that at the death of the high priest, Yeshua, there was now freedom and the man could return back to his home or back to his land. Do you see see the picture in that? And that is, is really, uh, that was exciting for me. <laughs> so the high priest's death would purge the land of, of that blood. Remember that, that blood that was shed? Uh, it, would, it would purge, his death would, would purge the land, purify the land, and uh, he could be... Um, uh, be able to return home. Those, those then that were guilty of an accidental death were set free. They were able to leave the city and to return home. So, so th this connects with the, the Yovel and with Yeshua setting us free. Yeshua then made it possible for us to be able to come back home. And when I say home, I'm, I'm referring to the land. 
where we, we have been exiled into the nations. And because of his death then, because of the death of the high priest, as we're all guilty of murder, we have spoken things with our tongue that were not so kind. So in Romans 5, 8, I'm going to read a couple passages here. Romans 5, 8. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that the Messiah died on our behalf while we were still sinners. The man was still guilty. He was in the city of refuge. He was still guilty of a death. But at the death of the high priest, he's, he's set free. Therefore, since we have now come to be considered righteous by means of his bloody sacrificial death, how much more will we be delivered through him from the anger of God's judgment? For if we were reconciled with God through the son's death, then we were enemies. How much more will we be delivered by his life now that we are reconciled? One more, or two more verses. Uh, not only will we be delivered in the future, but we, will, but we are boasting about God right now because he has acted through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah through whom we have already received that reconciliation. Here is how it works. It was through one individual that sin entered the world and through sin, death. In this way, death passed through to the whole human race in so much as everyone sinned. So we, hopefully we, we see a picture of this when we talk about Adam and through his because he had authority over the earth, that through his sin, he brought sin upon the world. But through Yeshua, through a righteous act, he has brought a means for reconciliation and brought life. Ephesians 2, 8, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2, 10. Paul again speaking to those in Ephesus. And he says, For we are of God's making, created in union with Messiah Yeshua, for a life of good actions already prepared by God for us to do. So this is what we're talking about here is Vaikra. All these instructions, that these things that we are to do to, uh, to, do, uh, to live our life through doing good actions. Therefore remember your former state, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcised by those whom were merely because of an operation on their flesh called the circumcised, at that time had no Messiah. So we were in the city of refuge. We're in a place where there's, there's protection, but, we, but hadn't been released from there yet. You were estranged from the national life of Israel. You were foreigners to the covenants embodying God's promise. You were in a world without hope and without God. But you, who were once far off, have been brought near through the shedding of Messiah's blood. Now, I read this a couple, uh, a couple of weeks ago. What is it that, yes, we were brought near to the Father, but we were also, he's speaking of the national life or the nation of Israel, that we are brought close. We're no longer foreigners to that life, but we are, we are brought close through covenant, because this is how God deals with his people, is through covenant. So we are brought near, we are brought into the nation of Israel through that covenant. So now we have the promises. In uh, I want to go I 
had a verse that I wanted to jump to. Okay. So if we're part of Israel, we are part of the seed of Abraham. We were talking about this on Thursday nights, that one of the promises that God made to Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. Oop, Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. God is entering into covenant with Abraham. Genesis 12. 15 and 17. So here in chapter 12, he calls Abraham out. He says, get yourself out of your country, away from your kinsmen, away from your father's house, and go to a land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great. And you are to be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who curses you. And by you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You want to be the seed of Abraham. Right here. Because you are the seed of Abraham, the Father has made a covenant with Abraham and his descendants and said, I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. Why did he go and get the children of Israel out of Egypt? He heard their cry. They were being cursed. And he said, I, I, hear, I hear their cry. I will bless those that bless them. I will curse those that curse them. Here we are in exile again. Oppression heaviness, darkness coming upon us. You want to be in covenant with the Father. You want to be the seed of Abraham because this applies. The Father still keeps covenant. And we were talking about this on Thursday night, how all these covenants all are all intertwined and, and, and tie into each other. God speaks here a little bit later in 15. He tells Abraham that you know, your, your seed is going to go down into a land and they're going to be oppressed. So he's making the Abrahamic covenant, but at the same time he's speaking of the covenant to come, the Mosaic, what's called the Mosaic covenant. So they're, they're, they're tied together, they're, they're, they fit, they build on top of one another. You want to be in covenant with the Father, you want to be a part of this seed, the seed of Abraham for this promise. This is one of many promises. But ha hang on to, this, to this, this promise. I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you and by you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we're, we're living this out today because we are, uh, I am, and I believe the rest of us <laughs> identify with, with as being seed of Abraham and that through that family that we are being blessed by him I am being blessed all, all of the families of the earth are being blessed okay I want I want to have fun for just 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 a minute um, I have I want to show you some things with Leviticus and uh, huh there's, yeah well there's ten copies there sorry about that we're going to open two two applications here we're going to look at Matthew Chapters 5, 6, and 7, just, just for a couple of minutes. Oh, I need one of those. Um. <laughs> okay, so... So the, the Torah portions themselves speak 
on the mountain my statutes uh, tie tie together with the Sermon on the Mount. Speak, speak, speak my statutes. Speak my laws. So we're going to start in uh, Leviticus chapter 21 and Matthew chapter 5. Oh, so I have two, two uh, applications opened up here. I think this will work. I think I can do this. I was doing it earlier. <laughs> All right. So uh, Yeshua is speaking, and, and he goes t- in Matthew chapter 5. He begins to speak the Beatitudes, what we call the Beatitudes. How blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. How blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How blessed are those that are meek, for they will inherit the land. So speaking of, of all of these these blessings, and uh, in if you when when we get down just a little bit further here, how blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. How blessed are those who show mercy, for they will be shown mercy. How blessed are those that are pure in heart, for they will see God. How blessed are those who make peace, for they will be called sons of God. How blessed are those who are persecuted because because they. Um, Pursue righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So if, you, if you'll notice here that uh, a, a lot of these things that he's speaking to are uh, in, in this are kind of a, a, a step up, a higher um, step up f- from the average, let's say the average believer. S- um, How can I say that? Okay. Let's say um, how blessed are those who are the peacemakers. Aaron was known, the high priest Aaron had this uh, personality. He was known as a peacemaker. He was known as the one that that brought brought people together. It is said that uh, during the time of the Exodus that more children were named Aaron than any other male name because of Aaron's characteristic of peace. And you can kind of see this between him and Moshe. Moshe's more of the mm, stern, strict <laughs> kind of personality. And Aaron, more of the, the peacemaker. You kind of what got him in trouble with the golden calf. You know, he was trying to make peace. So so you can kind of see in this, in, when he's going down through this, that he's... It appears that he's he's calling you know to a higher to a higher level. Uh, one of the things that we'll notice in these three chapters that they call them the fence laws, where God is is uh, or Yeshua was kind of putting a fence around some of some of the instruction. In other words, guarding it, like like a pr- a priest or would do. So, in Leviticus twenty two. And verses, verse 17. I'll just show you a couple of these, and then you have the notes there, and can kind of this is scroll down to 17 here. It says, uh, it's t- entitled, An Acceptable Offering. And so the instruction was, Adonai said to Moshe, Speak to Aaron and his sons, and to the p- entire people of Israel. And it goes on to say that, Here's what will be an acceptable offering. Well, if you go down just below the Beatitudes, now these don't match up one for one. Uh, But if we go down here to verse 23 in Matthew chapter 5, we're given the instruction of an acceptable offering. So if you are offering your gift at the temple altar and you're there, you remember that your brother has something against you, leave. So, so we have this, so a, 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 an acceptable offering. Here's, here's what will be an acceptable offering. Here's how you present an offering. Then in uh, uh, Leviticus, so let's go down, uh, b- bounce up to 14. Remember Yeshua talking about salt and light here? He speaks to that you are the light of the world, a town built on a hill, in the next chapter here, uh, no, I'm sorry. We're just going to scroll down 
No, it's in 24, sorry. Uh, right, right away in, verse, in chapter 24 speaks to the menorah and bringing the oil, bringing the crushed, order the people of Israel to bring pure oil, crushed olives for light to keep the lamp burning. Yeshua over here in verse 14 speaks, you are the light of the world, a city hidden on a, on a hill. Let your light shine. Let your, let your light shine. So another one of these parallels, uh, the eye for an eye thing. Um, Matthew 5, 38 through 42 and Leviticus 24, 17. So just a little bit further down here in Leviticus 24. An eye for an eye. Anyone who strikes another person and kills him must be put to death. But it, it deals with this eye for eye. Uh, same thing with Yeshua here in Matthew 5, 38. Speaks to... You've heard it. You've heard that your fathers were told an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So he's... It's, it's almost as if he's mid the these these Torah portions here and and explaining them, and it goes it it goes on a little bit further. I laid out a few of them there about uh, laying up treasure. He speaks of laying up treasure, and and I connected it to the sabbatical year that that don't don't work seven days a week. Don't do these things. Don't work seven years out of seven, but and try to lay up treasures, but lay your treasures up in heaven by following his covenant, by following his rules, his covenant rules. Don't be anxious. When it comes to those three years during the, the Jubilee that you aren't going to be able to work, don't become anxious. Your father cares for you. He'll see it to it that your, your needs are met. Matthew 7 In verse, this one I wanted to actually read, Matthew 7, 7. It is entitled, Ask, and it will be given to you. Keep asking, and it will be given to you. Keep seeking, and you will find. Keep knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who keeps asking receives. He who keeps seeking finds. And to him who keeps knocking, the door will be open. Is there anyone who, if his son asks for a loaf of bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will give him a snake? So even you, so if you, even though you are bad, know how to give your children gifts that are good, how much more will your heavenly Father, your Father in heaven, keep giving good things to those who keep asking? Leviticus 25. It's in this Torah portion. Leviticus 25, verse 20. Speaking of the Shemitah and the Yovel, If you ask, if we weren't allowed to sow seed or harvest what our land produces, how are we going to eat the seventh year? And he says, then I will order my blessings on you during the sixth year. If you ask, if you ask, and you keep asking, if you ask, Father, how... Are you going to provide for me on that seventh year? Then I will order my blessings on you during the sixth year so that the land brings forth enough produce for all three years. Would your heavenly father give you a snake when you ask for a loaf of bread? Would he give, I'm sorry, would he, a stone? Or would he give you a, f a snake instead of a fish? 
for me, this just fit right together. I, I was like, wow. <laughs> so Yeshua says, tells us to ask, but ask in the context of, Father, how am I going to survive? How am I going to be able to provide for my family? How, how am I going to be able to make it through these three years of, of um, uh, no, no harvest? And I, and I want to take this just a, one more step further. Um, there's some... That the time of the great tribulation... Father, how will I provide? How will I sustain? When these times come, Yeshua said, ask. Keep asking. We're not asking for things that are, that are frivolous, but ask for the, because he's talking about bread, fish and bread, the provisions, things that I need just, just to live. And he says, ask. And I, and if, ask if, if um, he says, I will order my blessings on, on those during the, the sixth year. So this would actually be the 49th year here on the sixth year of the seventh year cycle um, because there's going to be three years there that there isn't going to be any produce. And so it will be with us during the, what we know is the, the great tribulation there's going to be a time where there may not be produce. There may not be what we need just to sustain. So instead of worrying, he says, don't be anxious. Just prior to this, don't be anxious. Don't you know that your Father in Heaven, the, that you're in covenant with, your Father in Heaven, if you ask for bread, he's going to give you bread. If you ask for a fish, he's going to give you fish. He's going to meet your needs. He's going to take care of you. He's going to see you through. At the very end of both chapters 7 and the very end of, of Leviticus chapter 26, both speak to the uh, authority And this is that big. <laughs> Verse 45 of 26 says, uh, Rather for their sakes I will remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt with the nations <coughs> watching so that I might be their God. I am Adonai. These are the laws and the rulings and the teachings that Adonai himself gave to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai through Moshe. These are the laws and the rulings, the instruction, the, the, the instruction, verse 29 of chapter 7, for he was not instructing them like the Torah teachers, but as someone who had authority. Both on the mountain both giving instruction, one through Moshe, one through Yeshua. But there is so much in these six, seven chapters of Leviticus and in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 that are just inter intermingled and, and tied together. Read these. Tie it, it, it's, it's so beautiful how it, it, it really really fits fits together. The Father loves us. He loves each and every one of you. He cares about you. He wants to meet your needs. He wants you to not be anxious, to not be fearful for the things that, that are ahead of us, but to be, to trust and as we, as we live this life, as we walk this walk, little by little, we gain more trust and confidence in, in who he is. We're the ones that need the, <laughs> the education, that need the teaching, that need the, uh, 
the, the testing so that we know that he's faithful, but it's just, is my faith faithful to what he is faithful to me? Wow, <laughs> that could become twisted up. All right, am I, is my, is my hope secure in him? Because we know that he's faithful. But is, is, has my hope become anchored? And as, again, as we see little um, blessings and things happen along the way, then we know the Father, um, these, these are little demonstrations of, of, of building our faith. These little, little nuggets. Uh, this thing with the shirts is just another one for me. It's just, wow. Another little, little nugget that uh, the Father's watching us. Um, in Revelation chapter 7 to one of the Messianic communities, he says, uh, Yeshua is speaking, and he says, I- I've seen your deeds. In other words, I- I- I'm, I'm watching you. I-, I, see, I see what you're doing. I see, I see your deeds. Don't think that, that I'm a, a, a Messiah that's, that is, is out of the picture, but, but I'm watching. I, I, see, I see what's going on. I see your deeds. I'm paying attention. And so may we be walking in the instruction, pleasing our Father, doing, doing to the best of our ability, and as He gives us more, as He gives us a little more light, that we, we take that and we run with it to draw closer. It's all about, it's all about drawing closer, both individually and, and as a community, as, as an assembly, that we... we walk and pull together. So I hope that was it, it blessed me. I hope it I hope this blesses you. So are we oh we have a that's right. We have a what I think we're going to need this. Hello. <laughs> the one who calms the raging storm. The one who walks upon the sea. Earth and heaven on your own. Yet you're watching over me. How majestic is your name. There is none like you. There is none like you. Together we proclaim the power of your name. 
because there's none like you who can stand before your throne. Your kingdom will forever reign. We will sing a song of praise to the ancient of days. Cause there is none like you. There's none like you. Together we proclaim the power of your name. Cause there is none like you. There is none like you. Cause there is none like you. Together we proclaim the power of your name, cause there's none like you. How majestic is your name? How majestic is your name? How majestic is your name in all the earth? How majestic is your name? How majestic is your name? How majestic is your name in all the earth? There is none like you. There's none like you. Together we proclaim the power of your name. Cause there is none like you. There's none like you. Cause there's none like you. Together we proclaim the power of your name. Cause there is none like you. How majestic is your name? How majestic is your name? How majestic is your name? Together we proclaim the power of your name. Cause there's none like you. Good job. Good job. There is none like you. Together we proclaim the power of his name. There is none like you. Wow. Thank you. That was precious. Thank you. Thank you. Goodness, like I said, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> going out for Mark and Carol. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Give me a microphone. <laughs> <coughs> Those people on the... They can't... They can't. Yeah, Ram Lamb, we had to move the babies that were being weaned, the boys, away from mamas. They don't appreciate that at three and a half months but they're getting over it. <laughs> oh, it's always good to have the little one. We do start him young around here. Um, like, like this. This is how we wash dishes now. Yes, 
We're, we're a team. This, <laughs> hand him over. <laughs> he has a bad thumb to, <laughs> yeah, on that hand. I just had thumb wrapped. And <laughs> I'm like, well, between the two of us, we've got, here we go. we got a whole set. <laughs> I mean, we've a pair. Yeah, we have a we have a set. <laughs> yeah, that was yes. that was pretty funny last night. That was it was or interesting. Yesterday yeah. afternoon, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all right. As usual, um, we're coming down the pike here on the uh, kids camp weekend, um, and because of how we were blessed, we have money to do more things with as far as uh, food items and games and so on. We've got. Goodness, we've got sleeping bags that have been pulled out and washed and aired out in this beautiful weather. Um, so we're all getting excited about the, the uh, teen weekend. And of course, Shava Ode on Sunday, so we'll have all the families together for that. And um, we're dragging everybody along, Gigi. <laughs> I want to mention that, that Sunday afternoon when you come um, to Shava Ode services, your families are welcome to stay all afternoon. The Heckmans have offered the playground, the field, the creek, uh, for as long as you'd like to stay. Yes, yeah. So bring, and bring, it is bring beautiful. stuff that can get wet. Yeah, it's the beautiful with a stream going through the property, a couple streams. I mean, it's just a beautiful place to spend some time. It's got shade trees. It's got um, swing sets for the younger kids. We'll have various games set up, you know, croquet and so on. So it'll just be a really fun afternoon for everybody. That's, that's two weeks away? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, just next two weeks. Shabbat, are we going to try to do a mikvah next Shabbat? Be prepared for a little cold water, all those that are going to join us. We're going to have some rain this weekend, so hopefully the water won't be too high. Um, there's a very pretty spot down here at New River, which we've gone to before so um so before before the f feast a, a, a mikvah so um, those that can okay. participate they yeah, bring some change of clothes same with uh, especially for the children um, there are places to play and get wet and things like that so mm -hmm. they're welcome to bring changes of clothes uh, for shovel up for that Sunday and uh, there's a pretty good size Parking. branch Parking I, I, oh. we call it a branch it's not really a creek but there's there's a lot of water to play in and uh, so and I think I think that's it we're going to go down um, sometime probably a day or two before and set up some canopies oh the uh, oh that uh, uh, bring your own chair bring uh, we, we have a, a bunch of camp chairs that we'll be taking but um, if you wouldn't mind bringing uh, your camp chairs and uh, uh, for, for Sunday that that Sunday Shabbat for Shavuot yeah Saturday yes so that would be next uh, next Shabbat so we can do that after Oneg Probably people want to eat first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> An hour after we eat. Okay. Old wives' tale. Uh, no, no, there's no age restrictions. No. Mm -mm. Yep. Correct. Yep. Yeah. We had um, last the last one we did. Uh, um, our nephew was here. He yes, was he was um, nine? seven. No, nine they were seven? seven and eight years old yeah. at that time. So yeah, we had a little one join us the last time. Yeah, that was, and I think we had, uh, I, f I forget, we had a handful of people that uh, mm -hmm. went down. Yeah, so I would encourage you, uh, here's, here's what I would encourage. If you haven't mikvahed since you've come into this walk, I would encourage you to do so. Um, I would just yeah I would just just encourage that, and we'll we'll have a little um, instruction, you know, down there, uh, just kind of kind of just a little bit of information how what what it's what it's what it's doing what so so a mikvah is to represent you know new birth, so you know, it's it's to uh, as if we were being born again you you come through water, 
uh, when you're born. And it's a representation of being born, literally being born again. You, you're going under the water, you can't breathe there, and you come up in new life. You're being born through the waters, through the mikvah. And, and we so won't it let anybody float away if, <laughs> and we, if it's yeah. going fast. And I, have, I have a good catcher that's, <laughs> that's helped me before in the past, catching people that, because uh, there, there are some currents down there in some places that uh, as, you just, as you come back up, you, you can lose your balance, so we'll, we'll catch you. Just okay. throw out an arm, and we'll be there to make sure that everything goes under. <laughs> <laughs> Deep breath. <laughs> There's hair floating. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's fun. It really is. And it's very um, uh, spiritual. Yeah. Um, I... I mikvahed with my shofar the last time that uh, we mikvahed to, so you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, bring your shofar along if you choose to. So that'll be next, next, next Shabbat, Shabbat. After, right after Oneg. Okay, uh, well, let's have some bread. A cute, pretty little holla. Isn't that pretty? Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaHulam HaMotzi Lachem Min Haaretz Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And forgiven us, Yeshua, our Messiah, who said, I am the bread of life. Now the cup. Baruch Atar Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaHolam Bare pari hagafen. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine, and forgiven us, Yeshua, Messiah, who said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. L'chaim. Yevarekaka Adonai Veishmureka Yaer Adonai Penaveleka Vihuneka Yisa Adonai Penaveleka Vesimleka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus our Messiah. Amen and amen. Father, we thank you for for the instruction that we received today. Father, may we learn and glean from what you have prepared and given to us. And may we, Father, make changes and adjustments in our lives, Father, that would draw us closer to you, that we continue to walk in the holiness that you have given to us, sanctifying us and setting us apart. We are called to be holy because you are holy. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to serve and to be a part of your kingdom. And we thank you, Father, for this community, for this group of people, Father, that you are bringing together. And we ask, Father, that as you bring others in, that we uh, learn to walk and to grow together and to carry out the 
the plan that you have for us, the instruction that you have for us, to be a light here to our community and to our families. We thank you, Father, for the food that we are about to receive. May it bless us and nourish our bodies, Father. Heal us and bring total healing inside and out. We thank you again, Father, for your many blessings. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.